is what Paul says. He's speaking to Christians, those who profess faith in Christ, those who are trying to walk with God in the life, and he tells those people, do not give the devil a foothold in your life. Which implies that uh, he, he's not talking to non-believers out there on the street who, by the way they live, are giving the devil a foothold every day of their life. What's going on about here? He's talking to Christians and he's telling you and me as believers, make sure that you yourself, as a Christian, do not give the devil a foothold in your life. Somebody once made a, a thing out of this and he says, um, if you give the devil a foothold, then sooner or later that foothold will become a stranglehold and it will eventually um, take over your life in such a way that it begins to destroy you. Amen. And uh, so he makes that point, don't give the devil a foothold. So therefore, it must be possible for a Christian and a believer to actually give the devil a foothold in your life. So this is where you come across one of the first principles of living in the Christian life. If you want to be a spirit-filled life, if you want your Christian life to be a success, and if you want to influence the people around you, and indeed other people out there, for good towards the kingdom of God, then one thing that you have to make sure that you do in your life, in your own personal life, is not to give the devil a foothold. Amen. And what I'm, I'm actually going to go on to, what I want to develop here, is not the issue, not so much the issue of you giving the devil a foothold in your personal life, but the consequence of that, because if the devil gets a foothold in your life, he has automatically got a foothold in your family. He's got a foothold in your home, because he's got one in you, and you are in your home, and, he, and you are in your family. And if he can get a foothold in your life, he's therefore got beginnings of an open door to start to influence the people in your family through the foothold that he has in your life. Can I hear an amen? amen? You all know that saying that when, 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 you know, when somebody's trying to get in through a door, they get their nose in first. You've all seen it, yeah? You know, you've got the door and it's slightly ajar and they, they got their nose. You see it in cartoons, don't you? You know, kind of Tom and Jerry's. You, got, you get their nose in and then having got their nose in, they continue to push and then they get their head through and then they squeeze their body through and then before you know where you are, they're in the room, they're through the door and they've got, yeah? And then you've got to deal with what is coming to your room. That's the kind of scenario. If you give the devil a foothold, then he's got his nose in. Then he'll get his head in, and then he'll get his body in, and then he'll, he'll get himself fully and completely into the, that, that, that part of your life where he's trying to influence. Can I hear an amen? Amen. amen. Don't give the devil a foothold. Because if you do, you're going to influence, he's going to get into your marriage, if you're married. Yes, husband, yes, wife. If he can get into your life, then he will then begin to influence your husband or your wife, your spouse, through you and through the foothold that he has in your life. Amen. A foothold is a place where the devil is allowed to run freely. It's a place where you listen to temptation. It's a place where you give in to something and you allow and you tolerate that thing in your life to a degree that it's able to influence and control you and therefore it can begin to influence and control other people through you. Amen? Don't give the devil a foothold through your television. Can I hear an amen? amen? Okay? Don't give the devil a foothold. Don't allow, I mean if you come to my home, you won't see a film on the telly that's greater than a twelfth. You won't see bad language coming to my home as long as I've got that remote in my hand, it goes off. My kids know. My wife knows. Any nudity or that kind of stuff comes into my home through the TV, it's switched off immediately. Those are the standards we've set for our own home. And whether my kids like it or not, that's the standard that's going to be kept. 
Ya. Alcohol won't be freely available in my home. Cigarettes are not allowed in my home. If you want to smoke, smoke, but go somewhere else. And I'm not afraid to have a zero tolerance attitude towards it because I know that if I try as much as I can to keep to that standard, then ultimately it will save me, it will save my wife from a lot of heartache, and it will save my kids from getting stuck in habits that they that we would prefer them not to get involved in. Can I give an amen? Amen. If you want to save your kids, then you've got to set the standard in your own home. Don't give the devil a foothold. Don't play around with sin. Don't tolerate it. Amen. <coughs> set the standard. Can I hear an amen? amen? Go to Galatians chapter 6 and verses 7 and 8. If you could stay seated. Galatians 6, 7 and 8. Well known words. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A person reaps what they sow. The one who sows to please his sinful nature from that nature will reap destruction. The one who sows to please the Spirit from the Spirit will reap eternal life. A person reaps what they sow. You sow to the flesh, you reap destruction. Okay, point two. The farmer goes out to sow a seed. He sows one seed, the seed goes into the ground. Let's focus on that one seed rather than the others. That one seed, you know, takes root, begins to germinate, begins to grow, the stalk comes up, and eventually you get the ears of, 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 of wheat at, at the top of the stalk, yeah? Now notice this. The point of sowing one seed is so that hopefully you can produce a stalk that at the top of it will have, I, I, I mean I've never counted how many seeds there are at the top of a stalk, but there's a lot more than just one, aren't there? There's probably, I don't know, 20, 25, I don't know, you know, correct me, go out and count it next time you go to a farmer's field, pluck one off and count them and tell me how many you find, yeah? Probably 15 or 20, I don't know, but it's something of that order, you've seen it, you know there's a lot more. But, the point I'm trying to make is this, what you reap is in a different order to what you have sown. <laughs> so if you sow one seed, you will reap 15 seeds. Yeah? Things grow. You'll reap more than you sow. And it's a biblical principle in the spiritual life. You reap, we reap what we sow. We may not reap it immediately. There may be a long season where we don't seem to have reaped much. But ultimately, if we have sown, then we will reap. If you sow in terms of giving, you will reap. If you give to God, God will give back to you. Give to God and He'll give to you, pressed down, shaken together and running over. It's in a different order. What you reap is much greater than what you sow. But it's also true in terms of sin. If you sow sin, you will reap destruction. But the destruction that you reap is much greater, of a much greater order than what you sow. Amen? Yeah. If my children, when I was bringing them up, had got used to seeing me drink that much from the bottom of a cup, regularly, yeah? And they'd have grown up with the idea, Dad drinks alcohol, but he only drinks that much. When they grow up, they will always justify the amount they drink by appealing to the fact that I used to drink that much. And they get used to seeing me drink that much. Are you with me? But they won't drink just that much. They will drink that much. Yeah? Instead of drinking one, they will drink eight. And they will justify drinking eight by appealing to the fact that they got used to seeing me drink one. Are you with it? Instead of judging themselves and saying, and saying to themselves, no, I should not be doing this regardless of what my parents or anybody else or my friends do or did. But as a parent, I've got to set the standard. 
by not drinking that much, so that later down the line, as the years go by, my kids are not going to get caught in the trap and try to justify them being in that trap because of the way I lived. Are you with it? I've got, I mean, you can't stop things from happening in people's lives. You can't do that because when they grow up and they become adults, they do make their own decisions. But what I'm saying is this, if you keep the door closed on the devil in your own home as much as you can, then you've done what you need to do to try to protect them in their life as they grow up. Amen. And if there is any reaping to be done in their life in the future, at least it won't be down to you. Are you with me? Yeah. You cannot stop your children learning to swear and learning bad language. Why? Because they learn it ultimately on the school playground. Yeah? My kids have never heard swearing in my own home. I don't do it. But did they learn? They hear it every day on the school playground. You cannot stop them learning and being influenced by things out there. But then what you've got to try to do is to learn to control it, yeah? So, but the, the point here in, in Ephesians is, don't you let the devil in your, in, in your life. Don't you open the door to the devil in your own heart, amen? Don't give the devil a foothold. Because what you reap, ultimately, will be much greater than what you sow, amen? John 10.10, 10, if you can get that up, I, Jesus came to bring abundant life. He came to bring life abundantly, but the thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Yeah, the thief comes only to steal, to kill, and to destroy. So if you allow the devil into your life, that is exactly what he's going to try to do. He's, trying to, he's going to try to steal, to kill, and to destroy in your life, and in the lives of your family around you. Can I hear an amen? amen. Do you want that? Do you want that? No, of course you don't. So where's it got to start? It's got to start with you not giving the devil a foothold in your own life. And therefore in your own home. Can I hear an amen? Amen. amen? amen. Then the devil can keep at least in your home free. Amen. Now, go to Exodus chapter 34 verses 6 and 7. Exodus 34 verses 6 and 7. He passed in front of Moses proclaiming the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. And verse 7, you allow the devil a foothold in your life and let the devil into your home. Then you've allowed spirits into your life. Let's talk practically. When a spirit gets into your life, it will begin to steal, kill and destroy in your life. That's why you've got to get rid of them. That's why you've got to cast them out. That's why you've got to learn to get victory over the devil every day of your life. That's why you've got to learn to fight spiritual warfare and have zero tolerance towards sin because it allows a spirit in. If you allow a spirit into your life, you're going to have a hard job trying to get rid of it until you learn to repent of the sin that's associated with it. Now if you allow a spirit into your life, it will begin to influence you, it will influence your spouse through you, and it will begin to influence your children through you as well. And they will become under the influence of that. Whether it's a spirit of anger, a spirit of bitterness, a spirit of lust, a spirit of, un of unforgiveness, no matter what it may be, right across the board, any sin that you keep giving into will eventually be a, a spirit into your life. That spirit gets a foothold in your life, it gets a foothold in your home, and it begins to, to, to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Amen? Don't play around with sin. Repent of it. Forsake it. Renounce it, and have nothing to do with it. Otherwise, the danger is that you can start off what's called a generational sinful pattern. A problem that was in one generation but never got sorted out begins then to appear in the next generation in their children. And if it doesn't get sorted out, then it, then it begins to influence it in the next generation. So you can see it, grandfather, 
great grandfather, grandfather, father, child, and so on that. And you can see it when you live long enough on planet Earth and you know enough people and their families and you know enough about their families, then you can begin to discern these generational patterns. Because and, and the generational pattern didn't get sorted out because there wasn't any real genuine repentance from the things that had caused it. Amen. And I'm going to illustrate this from a really tragic story in, in the Bible, but that's in a minute. Okay, another verse, Hosea chapter 8 and verse 7. Hosea chapter 8 and verse 7. They sow the wind and they reap the whirlwind. Yeah, that, that's another uh, another example of this reaping more than you sow. Yeah, you always reap more than you sow. It's a principle of life, and it's the same in spiritual life. If you sow the wind, you don't reap the wind. You reap the whirlwind. You know what the difference is between a wind and a whirlwind? Yeah, a wind can maybe knock you down if it's strong enough, but a whirlwind will destroy anything in its path. Amen. Don't sow the wind. Not so that you can simply get, you know, unaffected by that thing yourself. It's so that you don't bring the whirlwind years down the years down the path. Amen. If you want to save your kids, if you want to save your grandkids, then it depends. What 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 does depend upon you is that you you get the devil out of your life and therefore out of your family life. Chase him out. Get rid of him. Get victory over him. Repent from sin. Get clean before God and learn to live a righteous, pure, clean, obedient life before God. And that's the best way you can shut the door on the devil and get him out of your life. Amen. Amen. Now you all know the story of David and Bathsheba in the Bible in the Old Testament. We won't read it. It's very long. You can read it in 2 Samuel chapters 11 and 12. The person that gets the blame, of course, is David, because David was the king, and David's the main character that's whose life is talked about in the scriptures. Bathsheba comes into the story because of what happened, but then she quickly disappears from the scene, and the narrative carries on with David and his sons and the war and stuff that they were all fighting at the time. But everybody knows the story, and it's a tragic story. Bathsheba often gets away with it because the blame gets on David. But let's be straight. Bathsheba was an unfaithful wife. She was immoral. And she used men to climb to the top. To use a, a, a modern phrase, she slept her way to the top. That was Bathsheba's character. David's fault was because he was the king, and kings in those days thought they were above the law. Once you've become a king, you could make your own rules and you could live according to them. So David gets to this place where he's established as a king and he makes the mistake of thinking that he can live like any, he can, he can determine his own life, he can do just jolly well what he wants. So when temptation came his way and his attitude towards repentance from sin was lax, he allowed sin into his life and the rest is history. She got what she wanted, he got what he wanted, but the consequences were tragic. The only person in the entire story that comes out with any kind of dignity was Uriah the Hittite, that was Bathsheba's husband. Because he was loyal to her, he was loyal to David if you read the story through, but he, when he became a victim of David's sin, David tried to cover up his adultery and his immorality by committing murder and trying to stamp the whole thing out so that nobody would know. So Uriah the Hittite is killed on the battlefield, and David thinks that's the end of it. Hugh, he got away with it, he thought. Then one day God speaks to Nathan the prophet and shows Nathan the truth. Nathan goes to David, exposes David to his face and says, you're the man, you're the one, you committed sin. And the, one of the most tragic uh, uh, phrases, one of the most tragic things, if you get it up, Stacey, in 2 Samuel chapter 12, is, is the, are these words of, of Nathan. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from your house, because you despised me and took the wife of your right the Hittite to be your own. And in verse 11, this is what the Lord says, out of your own household, I'm going to bring calamity upon you, because, you know, and, 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 and so on. Out of your very household, I'm going to bring calamity upon you because of what you did. 
and the sword will never depart from your heart, from your house, because of the sin that you committed. In other words, David didn't get away with it. Further down the line, and the baby died as well, the baby that was born through that adulterous liaison died, God took his life. Grace came later when their second child became the next king. That was King Solomon. He was Bathsheba's second husband through David. But David reaped the whirlwind. Some decisions that you make in life are what we call, in developmental terms, they are called what are called critical incidents. And they can be both positive and negative. You remember Daniel, when Daniel went to Babylon, and that critical phrase in Daniel chapter 1 where it says that Daniel would not defile himself with the king's meat and wine because they were offered to idols. He kept the law of God even when he was in a strange land. David passed the test when the test of temptation came his way. Sorry, Daniel did. He passed the test when the test of temptation came his way. And he stood and he would not compromise on the word of God. And from that time on, Daniel becomes a prophet. God speaks to him in visions. God speaks to him in dreams. Some of the greatest dreams about the end times were given to Daniel. But the crux of it all, of it all was this. The hinge on which Daniel's future as a Christian hinge, well, the thing that it all hinged on was the fact that he would not compromise and he determined that in his case, regardless of what anybody else did, he was going to stay faithful to what he understood the word of God to teach. Even when he was in a strange land, he wouldn't bow to the pressure that was coming upon him to compromise on the word of God. He stood on his own two feet. He declared that he would not compromise and God blessed him for it. That's a critical incident having a very positive outcome. Here in David, you've got a critical incident having a negative outcome. David didn't get away with it. He sowed the wind, but he reaped the whirlwind. And if you, if you study the, the scriptures into Samuel, you'll see this. That it was that, it was at that point. You know, this is David, the man that killed Goliath. This is David, the man that wrote all the Psalms. This is the man that was secretly blessed of God, powerfully used by God. But even in his case, you know, his, his career is going up, as it were, in God. And then this incident happens with Bathsheba. And from that point on, everything goes downhill for David. And David can't stop it. Because he's released something into his own life and into, into the life of his own family that he cannot be tracked. He cannot go back on it. You read the story through. David's son Amnon has a, has a, has a, has a treats Tamar, his half sister, in a way that he, that, that he shouldn't. She suffers. There's sexual abuse there. Tamar's brother Absalom is so incensed with what Amnon did because David doesn't even, doesn't even rebuke Amnon for what he's done because he himself knows he's guilty of something pretty similar. Yeah? How can I tell my son that when well, I'm doing this? I've just done the same, pretty much the same thing myself. So David couldn't bring himself to discipline Amnon for what he did wrong. Absalom is so incensed with Amnon and with his father David that he goes out and he actually kills Amnon. Absalom then rebels against David because he's so sick and tired of the way David behaved and what was released in the light. He rebels. And he dies in the civil war that resulted from his own rebellion. And he even dishonored and uh, disrespected his own father David so much that he took all of David's concubines and laid with them in the old there, in public. Later on down the story, Adonijah thinks that he's got a right to the throne. When David's dying, Adonijah wants to become the next king. It's just self-ambition. But Bathsheba then appears again and oh, I want my son on the throne and, and, and God, that was actually God's purpose. But Solomon rises up and kills Adonijah. 
Because David allowed that kind of sin in his own life, because he allowed himself to commit adultery and then commit murder, those two sins reappear in the lives of his own children. And his own children get involved in sexual sin and murder. He sowed the wind, he reaped the whirlwind. And because his children, his sons were grown up by that time, David couldn't stop it. And the root of it was David's own sin. It's in his sons because it's been in his life. It carries on down through the generations. Are you with it? Now when Solomon became the king, he became the greatest king of Israel. You know, if the Jews today, they'll, even talk, they'll talk about King David and you know, the glories of the, the reign of King Solomon. In King Solomon's time, Israel reached its greatest ever geographical area, yeah? Right up into, into almost the Euphrates they reached, which is the promise that God had given to Abraham. Expanded greatly. There was tons of gold and silver. There was never as much material prosperity in Israel as there was in the time of King Solomon. Solomon made lots of political alliances with the, with the nations around, and he married the, 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 the daughters of the, the, the kings of the foreign lands. It was to form political alliances. It was a common thing they did in those days. But I have often wondered why Solomon allowed himself to get involved in so much sin with women. You know why? Because the root was in his own father, David. If my dad can do it, why can't I? And if he's doing it that much, I'll do it even more. I'll blow the balloon up until it bursts. So David's sin, the reaping of what David sowed in his own life, becomes even bigger in the next generation. It's time to repent. It's time to repent before God so that our children and our grandchildren do not suffer the consequences of our own sin. If you allow bitterness in your life, your kids will be orphaned. If you allow pornography in your life, if you allow yourself to see it, to view it, spirits will get into your life. Those spirits will then begin to affect the people around you. And if you get such a big grip upon you, then you can start becoming guilty of sexual assault yourself. That's why so many men end up in prison. Because it started when they were teenagers. They're reaping the whirlwind because of what they saw when they were younger. Some of them saw it in, the exam in, in their father's family. So they grow up and they're still watching the same stuff themselves. And it goes down generation after generation after generation. This is real stuff. And it ruins people's lives, it ruins marriages, it ruins family relationships. Sons grow up with sins in their life that they then take into their marriage relationship with them when they get married. And then lo and behold, they're getting divorced after so many years. Why? Because when they took when they got when they took something in, or the daughter did as well. Yeah. So I can't afford to let the devil get into my life. I've got to deal with the devil in my life. I've got to do it. To save myself and to save the people around me. I have got to learn to renounce sin and have a zero tolerance attitude towards it. You know, I talk to some Christians and I'm, I'm, I, I, it really makes me sad that they don't have the spine and the backbone to decide what the rules are going to be in their own home. And when people come to their own home, they begin to compromise because they don't they want to be a man pleaser and they don't want to offend the people that's coming to their own home. Yeah. 
If you want to smoke, it's fine. It's your choice. Do it outside. I don't have it in my own home. Don't ever bring alcohol into my home. If you do, and you want to drink it, that's your choice. But I will very politely invite you to step outside. And if I get my chance, I'll chuck it away. Pour it down the sink. Yeah? It's, it's, it's a zero. It's, it's keeping to a standard so that further down the line you don't end up reaping the whirlwind. Are you with me? If you gossip, your children will become gossips too. If you badmouth people behind their backs, people will do that about you. You'll reap what you sow. Take any example you like. If you use bad language in your own home, your children will copy you and they will imitate you. And they will think it's okay to start using bad language in your home. And then when they have a home of their own, what's going to happen in that home? Now again, you can't stop them learning it because they learn it on the school playground. That's where they learn it. But I'm talking about keeping to a standard and kicking the devil out of your life as much as you can to save your own home, to save your own marriage, to save your own kids, and to save your own grandkids. Be man enough to do it. Be woman enough to do it. Set a standard. Try to keep to it as much as you can. Prevail. Don't let the devil get on top of you. You get on top of the devil and you kick him out. Save yourself. I think I've, uh, yeah, I've gone through all of this. Be the example. And if things have gone on, then what's needed is confession and repentance. There is nothing better for your life than thorough, thorough, thorough repentance. Thorough. Everybody say thorough. Thorough means you, you deal with it all. You go right through it. You deal with things down to the bottom. Yeah, you get rid of it. Thorough repentance. And then having reached a place of forgiveness. See, David, David, David repented when Nathan went to it. He repented. And he knew it was wrong. And he was, he was, he was broken. But even though he was forgiven, he couldn't stop the consequences in the lives of his children. He couldn't stop it. He seeked it himself. The cat was out of the bag. The devil had come into the door. But as a Christian, you can deal with it through repentance, through forgiveness, through cleansing, and by holding to that kind of zero tolerance standard. And then when your children come to faith, they can find redemption through Christ in the same way that you have. 